And then a little bit about what it's like to be me, to be a psychiatrist. What do you actually do as a psychiatrist? Because people might be curious. And then um, I'll also give you some thoughts as a psychiatrist because, um, like Benson said, a lot of our parents and children are going through a lot of stress. So they want to save some money. So they will say, why don't you do two talks at once and also talk a little bit about stress. You know why I'm here. So I'll just also talk a little bit about that. But if you want to hear more, it, uh, it can be a longer talk. So beginning from the beginning, like how did I decide what to do? There's so many career choices. You might be sitting here in the audience as a child or young adolescents thinking, hey, what do I, what do I want to do? Well, I have to confess that Psychiatry is not my first dream. I know that people say you follow your dream. So my first dream, as I look back at my photographs, and it reminds me that maybe my first dream was to, to be this. Uh, you can see me there. Uh, I think I look pretty cute. Don't you think so? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's <a> very promising. <laughs> so this was the winners. And it was a group back that was big in the day. If you were from Hong Kong, you might have heard of it. Um, I think there are five people from Hong Kong here, so that's really good. So yeah, we were uh, all passionate about it. I thought it was going to be it, but uh, you can't be more realistic. So my next choice of what I really want to become. Artist. Huh? Artist. An artist, so that's really good. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to be Batman, come on. Uh, so um, my next thought was, hey, maybe I want to be an artist. And again, I thought that I was pretty good, pretty talented. Uh, but my parents said, you are pretty good, but you're just not good enough. You know? And you know, artists never make any money, you know, Chinese parents. Never, never go into the arts. I don't know how many of your parents tell the little kids that. Yes, you color inside the lines, but that means not uh, Listen to your parents and don't follow your dreams, because they don't come true. No. <laughs> So, of course, that's not my main message here, even though the parents at the back row are saying, yes, I can now tell my child what to do. So this is my early years, you know, thinking a bit about these things. I still draw and I still paint, but it's not my major career. Now, the next slide is going to take me to when I really thought about what I would become next. And uh, does anybody know who this guy is? Yeah. How many people know? Okay. Okay. Okay, 10 people, so that's double. Okay, so Sam Hoy, he's like a pop singer. Uh, you can see all the young generation say, who is that? Um, so in the ancient times, let me tell you, before there was internet, okay, he was the cool guy that there was when I was a kid. Um, so he was like a, a pop idol in, in Hong Kong. He was one of the people who made pop songs popular in Cantonese because at that time, Cantonese pop songs wasn't all that popular. And I was really impressed as a little kid about his songs because they were really funny, they were really rude, and that's why I was so interested in them, and, uh, and I was championing them. And their lyrics were, were very dice, which is like, uh, how do you translate that? It's like, uh, you know, it's really a uh, crew. So I think that uh, I think that captured my imagination. The other thing I have co in common with him was a, a true story. Like when I was in uh, kindergarten, uh, one day uh, I was uh, going home on the school bus, and I heard, "Hey, guess what? Today, today is very special. It's a birthday of someone so special." And I figured out it was his birthday, and that reminded me, "Oh, that's my birthday too, September 6th, right? Isn't that fun?" <laughs> and, and and that's when I. I said, I almost forgot my birthday, and I told my parents, guess what today's day is? It's Samuel's birthday, get it? And they don't get it, but it was my birthday, my parents forgot my birthday too. So, <laughs> so maybe that's why I became a psychiatrist, because my parents uh, forgot my birthday. No, that's not the real reason why. So, um, I was curious about how he was able to come up with such clever lyrics which reflect the people's thoughts of the day, you know, using really, really crude lyrics that is politically really incorrect. And my dad said it was because he studied psychology in university and he really understood how people think and he can really empathize with general citizen struggle in Hong Kong. And I said, wow, that's so powerful. Maybe that's what I want to be. I really want to understand people. Like, 
Why do people behave the way they do? Why do they dress a certain way? Why do some people are some people are interested in this, but other people are interested in that? What people what make people think the way they do? Isn't that fascinating to be able to really understand what your parents are thinking, what your neighbor is thinking, why some people are stressed, other people are happy? So I think that this is my earliest idea that no, yeah, I want to be in the field of you know, psychology and understanding people. I think the other thing is that he does many kind of songs. A lot of, most of the songs are really, really silly. And there are some songs that were deeper. So when I was a little kid, this used to be my mantra as a little kid, this, these words on the screen. Anybody who can read Chinese can tell me what these words mean? Anybody? I think someone was nodding your head. Can you say something? Can you, yeah, can you explain to the group what this means? Okay. It's the, uh, louder. You, you, didn't, you didn't need to be loud. <laughs> it's your faith that you have something, but if you don't have, don't uh, put yourself for the dream. Yes, yes, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. By the way, what career do you do? What job do you do? Uh, actually, in statistics. Statistics, see? Listen to the statistician. <laughs> so, um, those words, as a little kid, was my uh, also um, move me deeply philosophically. That sometimes life, life has certain fate, and sometimes if it's yours, then it will be yours. But other times, like if you try to force something that doesn't come true, like if I try to put on a Batman suit, it's just not going to work very well, right? So sometimes we have our dreams, and then we also can be realistic, and also we can see what life is there to unfold for you. So up to this point, it's still about being realistic, and some of my earlier dreams may not be that practical, but this perhaps was my first practical dream, really to understand people. And then when I was in high school, your age, in the audience, uh, one of my science projects was around this issue. Um, this book is called Subliminal Seduction. Anybody heard of this book? Yeah, probably nobody. Um, so that's why I did a science project on it. Uh, it's called Subliminal Seduction because um, it's about how advertising can work according to this author. So this author, I think at one of his times was working in Ontario, University of Western Ontario, but he is also from the States. And he would ask you, like, this glass, does it look sexy to you? Right? So his major thesis is that our minds are also affected by unconscious things. Like you think you're listening to me talk, but you can be influenced by other things subconsciously that you don't even know about. So that is the subconscious mind. And he went in to investigate and study the advertising industry. You know, when you have a pop-up ad on computers, you know what I mean? By ads, right? That's what advertisement means these days. It's a pop-up ad on YouTube when you look at it. So how do they make you buy certain things? Well, he believes that the advertisement industry also hide what's called subliminal messages, the meaning messages that you can't even see with the naked eye. So for example, in this glass, you might notice that there's a black spot in the center, and it's actually a little tiny human figure that might have been embedded by the advertising industry to make you want to you know, buy this drink. So some of it may not be true, but some of it could be true at the time of the industry, when you watch a commercial, when you look at a magazine, and even when you see a movie, they, the clips that's in between, that's so fast that the human eye cannot see, there could be a, you know, a subliminal message saying, you know, buy Coca-Cola or something. You can't see it with the naked eye, it's just a blink of an eye. And so some people use that method to communicate with the subconscious mind. So this is my science project all about the subliminal messages. I start trying to do an experiment. Of course, when you are in high school, you do an experiment. Who do you think your subjects are? Who? Guess who? Of course, your little brother and my parents. You know, I try to give them a subliminal message. You know, give me lots of money. But uh, I don't think that worked very well. Uh, but um, I got interested then in the unconscious mind, and I read the 
parts of the Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud interpretation of dreams, and then I want to become a psychiatrist at that point. So um, I get asked this very often uh, when I give talks, which is, so you're a psychiatrist, is that the same as being a psychologist? And what's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? And why do you want to be a psychiatrist and not a psychologist? Well, actually, they are overlapping sets of profession in the mental health field. Uh, you can be a psychologist and you can be a psychiatrist, and they are both uh, the, one of the greatest professions on earth. Um, so to be a psychiatrist, basically, is on the right-hand side, the purple. You go through uh, to become a medical doctor in medicine, so four years of medical school, and then you go through training to be a psychiatrist. So after four years of medical school, you get your MD license, and then further training in psychiatry. Do you know how long it takes to become a psychiatrist? How many years of training? Guess. Six. Six. That's very close. Five. It takes five more years, right? So after your university degree, it takes four more years for medical school and five more years of psychiatry, uh, and then you become a psychiatrist. Nine years. Okay. Very very quick. And nine years goes by. So. So it's a relatively long road. The other path, if you want to interested in mental health, you can consider as a psychologist. So that's on this side. So basically you major in psychology in university, and then you can do a basically a PhD and you become a psychologist. And you can see the overlap. There is an overlap of what we do. A clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist can do overlapping things. There are certain things outside the circle. So a psychiatrist, like me, I'm able to also prescribe medication for my patients, like antidepressants, antipsychotics for patients who need it. Whereas a psychologist, uh, at least in Canada, they don't, do not prescribe, and they can do psychotherapy, like talk therapy. There are things that we don't do that's on this side of the circle, like we do IQ testing or personality testing. Those are things that I don't do as a psychiatrist, as a psychologist, as a psychometrist. Particularly, we go to school and test your IQ level, or your reading ability, or your reading disability, or other things like this. Right? But they are both great professions, and I would champion all of you to be a psychiatrist because it's a wonderful profession. We don't have enough Chinese psychiatrists around. As soon as you become Chinese psychiatrist, you will be like, you have no, no, no worries for patients because they are just underserved, and people want to see someone from their own culture who really understand. So, if you're ever afraid, you go into a profession that there's no business, or well, psychiatry, there's going to be a ton of business, okay? So, guaranteed. So, um, I, so, you have to work really hard to be a psychiatrist, though. So, you do have to study, you know, you have to tone down on your gaming a little bit uh, to, to do that, because you need to get to medical school. I just heard a parent go, see? <laughs> so, so, so it, you have to tone down a little bit on video gaming. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from video game too. Um, but uh, you have to tone it down a little bit to get into medical school. You study really hard, and etc. So I, I got into medical school. My parents were really excited because, as you, as all Chinese parents know, if your you know children is doctors, you're happy. So my 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 parents were really happy. I became you know a, a doctor and went to medical school. And then I said I want to be a psychiatrist. And this is probably like my mom's reaction is like, <laughs> it's like, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you crazy? Right? You went to medical school, which is a good job, and now you say you want to be a psychiatrist. Um, so this was like my mom's reaction. This is like the poster from the movie Cycle. Because when parents sometimes they hear the word psychiatry, um, it's it's they, they become fearful, right? So. And being a psychiatrist is really funny. You go to a party and you tell people, you know, you talk to people first, right? And then people say, so what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a psychiatrist. And then they suddenly stop talking. They, suddenly, <laughs> they go, you are probably analyzing me, right? And I said, you know what, it's too late for you. I already analyzed you. <laughs> I already know your secrets. So, so people when they hear psychiatry, they are really, really fearful. So, uh, my parents thought that I would become crazy if I be a psychiatrist because I'll be talking to crazy people all day long, uh, or some crazy people might hit me, um, and it's probably going to be a very dangerous profession. Um, and then, you know, also other people would think I'm crazy because you know you're not a regular doctor anymore. So I met with. Uh, 
quite like a, a little bit to a ton of resistance to my wanting to be a psychiatrist. Uh, and so this is the part where I said earlier, you know, how you, you have some dreams, but your parents might not like it very much. So at this point, my parents basically was really, really against me being in psychiatry because they thought it's going to be a dangerous profession for me and I would go crazy. Uh, but I kind of, this is the point where I kind of insist and say, you know, I need to really follow my dream. So uh, it really worked towards the end because I really eventually convinced them that I am passionate about this. And I, I guess I just uh, stood my ground uh, and I finally convinced my parents to let me be a psychiatrist. Um, I think uh, my parents finally were convinced that they said, I guess, which is the title of today's talk, that I guess we, have, we can respect every kind of profession, even a psychiatrist. So, <laughs> so eventually my parents became big supporters of me uh, continuing this field, and I don't want to say, stand here and say that my, my parents didn't support me, because towards the end they really did, after initially trying everything they could to stop me. So I became a psychiatrist, so am I screaming a lot, uh, I continue to scream a lot, no, just kidding. So this is just my clinic, so as I said, uh, this is what I do now. I am at the Toronto Western Hospital, which is a teaching hospital downtown, and uh, four days a week, I am there and I see Chinese patients, uh, both Cantonese and Mandarin-speaking patients in our clinic, with just not by myself, but my team. And you can see we all look pretty like normal people in the mental health field, my counselors, my social workers, right? And as you saw in my previous slides, because uh, you can do other things and still be a good counselor and help people. So the idea to be able to help people when they are stressed, right? When you see your parents yelling, you know, you know, next time when you see your parents yelling, ask them if they need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> They just may slap you in the face, but uh, <laughs> uh, don't say I told you to do that. But uh, we don't need any more business. So, but being a psychiatrist, I can have to say that it's one of the most rewarding career that you'll ever do. Every day I talk to people and they really tell me their doctor's secrets or whatever they're stressed about, whether it's because of their kids or because of their, their spouses or because of their parents. And really, we discuss solutions together. And people leave my office usually pretty cheerful. Hopefully, you leave the session pretty cheerful. And it's really a rewarding feeling to both be able to understand what, where people are coming from, help them help themselves. And that's a very empowering thing, empowering feeling. So I think the other thing that uh, I wanted to mention is I thought that I made the biggest decision of my life. Now I know I'm not going to be Batman, but I'm going to be a psychiatrist. I think I made all the tough decisions I need to make in this life. But in terms of your job career goals, once I went to psychiatry, I didn't know that you actually can be many different kinds of psychiatrists, right? Just like I suppose an accountant, you can be all kinds of accountants or a lawyer, right? So once you be a psychiatrist, the world suddenly at least to many, many, many doors that you can be interested in. Because you think that, oh, I'm just a psychiatrist, that's just a, such a small field. But it's not. It actually opens up doors to studying many things, from the human brain to how old people think, to how young people think. Uh, I'm particularly interested in those uh, three areas. General adult people, like you know, adult in the audience, why are you the way you are? but also culture, how culture, like being Chinese or being Asian, does that influence the way you think? Or psychotherapy, how do I use my talking and my listening skills to be able to help people in addition to medication? So just to give you an idea how culture influences the way you think, sometimes I uh, show this up as an experiment. Um, over here, there is the chicken, there is the grass, and there is the cow. In your mind, what two things go together, you think? Can you yell out what two things go together? Sorry? Chicken and cow go together. How many people chicken and cow? Okay. How many people say cow and grass goes together? Wow, a lot more people. So look around the room and that's an interesting psychological test. <laughs> it is because this is how culture influences the way we think. 
the more Asian you are, okay, the more likely you're gonna say cow eats grass, right? The more non-Asian you become, <laughs> okay, you will say no, chicken and cows don't go together. So this is the way that culture can influence the way we think. We tend to group things together by rules, like, oh, they are animal kingdom. You think we must be scientific. That's a very Western way of thinking. A more Chinese way of thinking is, what's the story behind it? I can see a cow eating grass. That's like the big cycle of life in the Lion King, you know? So, so, so the more you can see the contextualized picture, the more Asian you are. So isn't this fascinating? So this is the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Um, so, uh, I, uh, aside from the everyday work, I'm also interested uh, as an academic, how culture influences the way that people think. So I do a Cambodian group of people, and I start to learn, because I'm not Buddhist, everything about Buddhism. Um, five more minutes left, so I'll go quicker. Uh, so, but you see, I also learned in school, E equals MC squared, so time is relative. Five minutes could, could be really like 10 minutes if you square it. So, <laughs> that's why I'm not a statistician. If you square five, you get 10. So, um, now, uh, so I'm interested in, in, in how culture influence. So, I run some groups with a Buddhist monk to see how a Buddhist philosophy can influence impact on people's thinking. And there's this part where I'm also uh, at the university level holding events that talks about mental health, that helps people understand more about mental health. We call that MindFest, and I'm interviewed by a film producer, um, and, and also someone who appeared on a film, because there's also films about mental health. Um, we also do community advocacy, so uh, this is a project I've done, I've learned a lot from family doctor and nursing, um, and we champion for rights of people with LGBTQ, mental health, how can university students increase their mental health well-being? This is with six universities in Jinan uh, and Shandong uh, province. And this is to South Korea, and we are looking at how to deal with trauma. Uh, so you can see that, again, being a psychiatrist, even if you say you're interested in culture and psychotherapy, again, it opens up a million doors of where you can go to and what you can do. And a little bit about my personal life. Um, I brought my wife in the back and my son. Uh, is my son here? Oh, yeah, it's William in the room. So, um, he's a high school student. I said, why don't you come and hear me talk? So, um, my son is uh, uh, a very bright kid and he, uh, his future is ahead of him. He does have learning challenges. He's part of the autistic spectrum disorder and has ADHD. So lots of energy, exuberant energy, and always bouncing around. Uh, but he's a hardworking and bright kid too. Uh, at the same time, he gives parents a little bit of stress. I think he inspired me of what to do. And I also host uh, some groups for other parents who have children with learning and autistic spectrum disorder too. Um, so that parents can become less stressed and more relaxed. Right? So because, you know, Benson says, let's talk a little bit about stress, right? Why are parents here in the room so stressed about their children? And, you know, we all have our stresses. And so we can learn more how to cope better with stresses. And so the last couple of slides is like, how do we then deal with stress, you know? So some uh, advice from a psychiatrist. Well, I think the way we think is very important. So having a balanced thought is what we often talk and teach our patients, right? So it's always like this picture we see. So what do you see in this picture? Sorry? Yeah, or louder. A lady, see? You are mentally healthy, right? So, <laughs> so what else do you see? A young woman. Great. So you can either see a young woman or an old woman, right? So it really depends on how you see them. So it is again about being able to see the silver lining, the, the positive. So one message is being able to see that's both here. You can see both the old lady and the young lady. And also, you're sitting here in the audience. 
Like, which one do you want to be? Do you want to be young or the old? Well, it really depends on your perspective because the owner is wiser. So, <laughs> so even if you see the old lady, again, you can be very mentally healthy. It's about what you see. So another maybe final psychological test. So one point is about being able to see the positives in the things ahead of you. The second point is being aware of opportunities, awareness. So I'm going to give you a short awareness test. That's only going to take 30 seconds, which is still within my uh, five minutes. To... <laughs> so an awareness test, okay? So you have to pay super attention to see if you pass this awareness test. Wrong guy. Okay? <laughs> so, so this is actually a matter of awareness. Okay, counting is not even the most important thing. It is about noticing, and there's awareness test. So this is an awareness that there was a big gorilla in the room doing the moonwalk, right? So for those who saw it, it's a gorilla doing the moonwalk. Do you believe me? There was a big gorilla doing the moonwalk across the screen. And people say yes, right? One or two people now say yes, right? So do you want to see the gorilla? Yeah, for those of you who are like, this is a trick, it's a psychological trick, okay? So I'm going to rewind and just give you one last chance to notice the gorilla. Okay, this is your last chance. Okay, so we were here, and then we asked you to pay attention, so pay attention. This show, this shows that there's something that's right in front of your eyes, but you missed it. Do you know why you missed it? Because you were being misled and you were like being like counting the passes, right? This is a phenomenon we call rule following. All of us, since we're a little kid, we're told by our parents, you must follow rules. So we start to follow rules. And there are rules that are visible, there are rules that are invisible. Like in this case, why did you follow the rule? Like why did you follow whatever it says, right? Sometimes when we follow rules, that's when we miss the big picture in life. So imagine if this was your life. If you're just doing always what you are told, it can be from your parents, but even from society, oh, you need to make money, oh, you need to do this. So sometimes those are invisible rules, and it actually makes us miss what can be the most important treasures of our lives, which can be like the dancing gorilla of our lives. So think about that for a moment then. It's, yes, we need to all be obedient kids, so don't quote me on this, kids, don't quote me on this. <laughs> don't defy your parents and say you learned from a doctor. So, so when we follow rules, rules are there to guide us, but for every rule that we follow, we also have to think outside the box. We also have to be able to see and not let the rules blind us to seeing things. And that's why people go to work 9 to 5 just because they thought this is what they need to do. And sometimes after an experience like this, people might quit their job and really pursue your dream career or find a second career or do something that they are passionate about because at the end of the day, if you're passionate about something, then it's not just a job that becomes your passion, that becomes your life career. Like my passion here includes showing hundreds of millions of people the missing gorilla. And this is about helping people find what is missing in their lives that will make their lives richer, so that they're not just following rules and taking a checkbox in your you know, aptitude test or something. So I hope that this gives you some idea that you can all be running down the street looking for the hidden dancing gorilla around the next corner. What gives life meaning? And so this is the whole motto, which I don't obviously have time to get to. It's about giving help to other people and getting help if you need to. That is the best way to deal with stress because in giving people help, you are helping yourselves. And in asking for help, it's also a brief step to take forward. Every time you give help and get help, 
There's no shame in being a Cyrillic. If I didn't tell you, you didn't know about it, did you? So we all need that helping hand. So I think that brings the conclusion of 